All right. Uh, we're doing we're doing some counter programming tonight here, folks. I you know, it's not often that I say I won't see a movie, but um, it's not that I'll never watch Godzilla X Kong New Empire. It's just that it's at the very, very back of the queue. I've learned my lesson from the other legendary uh, movies that, um, you know, I just I can't get behind just watching giant monsters beat the crap out of each other for two, two and a half hours. It's kind of the same thing with the Transformers movies. They might be wonderful. I know, Mark, you love these films. And, you know, Katie uh, uh, Glidewell loves them, too. You guys had a, a great live stream the other night, which I still have to catch up with. So, yes, there is a lot of appreciation to go around. I just don't happen to be one of those folks. So in respect to Godzilla, we're going to do something a little different tonight. We're going to do Godzilla x Godzilla, or should I say Gojira x Godzilla King of the Monsters. Yes, we're traveling back to 1954 and 1956, respectively, to look at a film that is 70 years old this year and a movie that's 70 uh, or 68 years old, I guess. I can't do math. I went to art college. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about it. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by two very dear friends, Mark the Movie Man Krawcheck of Special Mark Productions and the Spoiler Room Podcast, of which I'm a guest most Mondays. Most Mondays. Uh, and... And Bill Goodmanson, the resin chef himself of Bill's Kitchen, or as he's known tonight, International Judas. Uh, Bill, I think you are the biggest Godzilla fan that I know. Mark, you might be the second biggest Godzilla fan that I know. So getting you guys together to talk about it, I, I had to have the experts on to guide me through uh, this experience. First of all, Bill, how you doing? Uh, very good. Um, Mark, how are you doing? I breezed right over you. <laughs> it's, it's quite all right. I, I, I'm doing good too. Uh... Excellent. I'm I'm doing great because, as I think I mentioned on the lead up slash tease to last week's show, um, I've never seen Godzilla all the way through. Um, I think I'd seen bits of it when I was a kid. My dad was, he was more into like Gamera. He had a fascination with Gamera for some reason, um, but I'd never watched Godzilla. And Bill, this is a bit of a story from a few years ago. You actually gave me your Criterion Collection Blu-ray of that's Godzilla. That's beautiful. Yeah, that one's it beautiful. It is nice. Yeah. So it, I did a, a great job. That is like the best, um, the best uh, transfer, uh, they, they got rid of a lot of negative dust. Um, the picture is just as better than anything that I've ever seen. That's the Blu ray, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I gave that to you because I got the uh, the big set and it has the same disc in it. So, so did you get the is it a is it a 4K set or was it like just a big Blu ray set of all the movies or something? Blu ray. Okay, because um, yeah, I was watching this. I was this. This looks great, um, but uh, yeah. So we're gonna. I, I pulled this thing off the shelf and I decided to watch it. And it's odd because I had to look for the 1956 version of Godzilla. It's actually listed as a special feature mm -hmm. <laughs> on the disc. It's not like because they, they have both versions of the film on there, but it's not like you put in the disc and it loads up. Oh, watch this or this. No, it's you watch Godzilla if you want to watch. Uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters, you gotta you gotta dig. And dig I did to find Raymond Burr um, starring as, I mean, right off the bat, his name's Steve Martin. I mean, that didn't mean anything to anybody in 1956, but to me, I just I couldn't not think of the the famous comic actor. Um, but I actually watched these movies in I think the perfect order. And that is I watched Godzilla King of the Monsters, the Americanized, bastardized version. And then I went back and I watched the Ashiro Honda uh, original classic. Mm -hmm. Now I say that's the right way to watch it because I feel like if I had watched the 54 Godzilla first, I don't know that I would have made it through the 56 version. I might've even like destroyed slash burned, <laughs> blown up that beautiful Blu-ray uh, that you lent me, Bill, or yeah. gave to me um, because it's an abomination, but watching the abomination first, I, I kind of knew what was going on. I'd heard the things like, Oh, they just took the 54 version and did all these inserts with Raymond Burr awkwardly. And you can totally tell, mm -hmm. but it, it's so funny and out of place. But what I didn't pick up on was there are so many other characters in the movie that we just get like glimpses of and passing mentions of, or like, you know, clips here and there. They're the main characters of the original film. So going to watch Godzilla 54, 
I was completely, you know, my mind was blown away. It was like the Stargate from 2001. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> this, this, uh, this lovely, beautiful monologue uh, by the doctor at the end of the film about, you know, what if there are other Godzillas and, and H-bomb radiation, you know, atomic radiation, all that stuff. What, what have we wrought essentially? Um, in the 56 version, you get Raymond Burr with a, with a voiceover saying, well, we defeated Godzilla. And you get a quick shot of the doctor from that speech, just kind of looking forlorn, I think right before he was ready to talk. I'm like, wow, that was definitely a decision. So Bill, I want to, I want to start with you. Give me, if you can, biggest Godzilla fan, a condensed version of when did you first watch Godzilla? Was Godzilla 54, was that your first Godzilla or did you come to other movies in the series and then kind of work your way back to it? And what was it about this movie or this series that really captured your imagination? Um, the first one that I saw was, uh, they used to have something here in Chicago called the 3.30 movie. Mm. It was on from 3.30 in the afternoon to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And... Um, they used to, sometimes they would do theme weeks. Um, I remember there was a monster week that I saw once uh, that was that had such gems as uh, Reptilicus in it. And, Ooh. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, but at, at one point, um, I had no idea what I was looking for, and I stumbled upon um, the 1964 movie, um, Mothra versus Godzilla, which was called Godzilla versus a Thing, in the United States, um, perhaps because the idea of Godzilla and Mothra didn't sound scary enough, not that it's a scary movie or anything. Um, although from the trailer, you would, uh, you would <laughs> it was. And I, I tuned in just sort of as Godzilla was coming out of the ground after being washed ashore by this hurricane. And I loved, at that time, I loved dinosaurs and I loved insects. And it was like, Okay, um, but that kind of fell back until I think 1969 when I was nine years old and they released uh, Destroy All Monsters in the mm -hmm. theaters. Me and a couple of my friends were dropped off by my dad at, um, I believe it was the Wilmette Theater and, um, and just left there, you know, on our own being told that we'd be picked up at such and such a time and you're just like uh, free range kids just uh seeing movies and that thing it had all these monsters it was super colorful it was total fun and that that put the hook in me mm. um i didn't see the original or i didn't see godzilla king of the monsters until uh, it's hard to judge time back then, but, you know, maybe a year later when it was on TV and um, it didn't really hit me, uh, do that much for me um, at the time. I mean, it was like, yeah, this is Godzilla, but it's kind of weird. And, you know, I, I had seen like a couple of other ones like Ghidra, the three headed monster again, which is like really colorful and crazy and, you know, has monster talking to each other scenes and, um, so it, it kind of, then I saw it a few other times, um, but it really wasn't until, oh, there was some point in the early eighties when the art Institute showed, uh, the original, uh, Godzilla. Oh, nice. And I got to see it on a, on a big screen in, in their, um, uh, their, their theater there. Unfortunately, there was like a five minute cut uh, of like the rampage through Tokyo. So like I'm watching it. And I'm going like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> um, and that's when I, I really got to know and really enjoy the, 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 you know, the beginning of all this stuff. So you saw King of the Monsters and then you saw. Yeah, Godzilla. well, I think like pretty much everybody in the United States. Mm -hmm. States at that time, there was no, no way to see the original one. Mm -hmm. Even, um, you know, we used to have com uh, correspondence in Japan and they would send us uh, beta tapes taken off of TV, nice. Japanese TV. We get these great Japanese commercials in the middle that were just <laughs> unintelligible and, but like no subtitles or anything. Mm. So, 
until you see it with the subtitles and you realize like, like well, there's a lot more going on in this movie um, than what we were used to. And since then, I don't know, I've seen, I've seen this one probably more than in the others because there's been a lot of screenings of it. When we had the um, 50th anniversary, they had it at the music box for mm -hmm. a week or two. Um, and then there's a show uh, called G Fest that um, pops up every July here, and um, they've shown it in theaters a few times. I mean, I think I've seen like half a dozen different variations on the subtitles, um, and most of them agree with each other. A couple of them, mm -hmm. for some reason, have decided to throw um, uh, the F word in there. <laughs> reason, um, where normally it's just sort of like, you know, somebody saying, damn, which probably i can't say for sure but probably is more accurate um yeah certainly yeah. It'll pull you out of the movie the way that well it's, it's like that scene in in uh, the 1986 animated transformers the movie where they have uh, some swear words they say damn and uh shit, shit. <laughs> yep. yeah 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 but i mean it, it was a little kid about to be eaten by a giant monster a planet eating mm -hmm. monster maybe it was his dad i don't care i can't remember but anyway yeah i mean that's the, the the weird thing is like watching godzilla king of the monsters and then finding out did, did you know that there was this japanese version out there before you started kind of corresponding with your friends and the guy sent it to you and there was a revelation was it disappointing to see that there was a, a whole other movie with out raymond burr i mean because they are two completely different movies i mean gojira is a straight up dark science fiction love triangle meets science drama and then king of the monsters is just i mean they might as well have had steve martin because it's just so <laughs> funny and weird i don't think I, I i i disagree i don't i don't think that king of the monsters is that bad it, it doesn't hold a candle to the original one but i think that for what they were doing at the time was Probably the only way that that movie would have gotten released in the United States. It, it did get released. It, it was shown in some theaters, uh, Japanese theaters in, uh, I think, in San Francisco and Los Angeles, maybe in Hawaii in the 50s. But that, you know, would never have, uh, never would have caught on. And, and I think that the, the whole Godzilla thing would not have caught on in the United States without the Raymond Burr version. Uh, yes, I, look, I agree that it's important and, you know, historically, I mean, you're talking about something that happened, uh, you know, nine years after uh, Hiroshima. And the whole theme of it is, you know, <laughs> the, the, the yeah. nuclear disaster and, and what, what it uh, brought about and the, the future implications for humanity. Um, plus, I mean, we, yeah, getting subtitled movies to, to show in, in major theaters, I think would have been, would have been a challenge for, for mainstream America, certainly at the time. I mean, it's something that still persists to this day, but to a lesser degree, but yeah, it's just when I'm watching the movie, even though I didn't have the full context for the original Godzilla, cause I was watching, you know, the, the sort of the Americanized remake, there are certain things that just didn't make sense. Like when Raymond Burr is uh, reporting from the scene of the destruction of Tokyo, and he's got all these vantage points, he's watching, I'm like, where the hell are you watching this from? <laughs> yeah. Are you like on a tower that's like on top of a hill, like the one mountain that Godzilla isn't destroying? Like what is going on here? There's the scene uh, where the um, in the original Godzilla, where the people are debating what to do about the monster, it ends up in this full blown like argument, people screaming at each other in this courtroom. We get that, but in King of the Monsters, but it's just like Raymond Burr in this sort of courtroom, and all of a sudden people start screaming at each other, and they're like, "Yeah, I guess this whatever happened over there is happening over there. I we don't need to know about it because it's some weird Japanese thing, I guess." Um, yeah, it just it doesn't work, and I think. I am such a fan of Godzilla now, I finally get why people would love these movies. Now, this is, I've only seen this one and the new Warner Brothers legendary movies, and I think there's a wide gap there. But one of the things I think that I'm missing from these newer incarnations is what I got in uh, the, the 54 Godzilla, which is a, a sincere story with something to say. Um, you know, I think really well drawn characters. 
and you know surprises for something that's 70 years old uh whereas now i think a lot of these modern films have succumbed to the kind of the blockbuster syndrome where it's like it's more about the spectacle the other thing is i don't know what happened but i know it's a guy in a suit stomping through you know model cities and everything but towards the end of the film uh particularly the 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 underwater climax and then that that assault on tokyo there's there are tricks of the camera and just the immersion of the story i forgot i was watching models and a guy in a suit when godzilla attacks the uh the tower that has the the news reporters in it and they realize that they're all about to die and they get that great perspective shot of them plummeting to their deaths into these you know rooftops i got I felt like I was on a roller coaster. My stomach went up into my mouth. It's just, it's incredible. Um, a, so yeah, nice I, homage to that. There's a nice homage to that in uh, Godzilla minus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, which I, which I do. I, I want to see that. And, you know, unfortunately, from what I understand, they're still trying to work out the home video rights uh, for that. There, it might be coming out in the fall, you know, <laughs> practically a year after it wins the Oscar. Um, but except, uh, and I'll put a brief plug in here, the Music Box Theater, which Bill just mentioned, um, in mid-June, they're having Godzilla versus the Music Box, where they're going to be showing, the, I guess, the complete Showa-era films and also Godzilla Minus One. So hmm. I'll have some information about that down below so people can check it out. And but, Shin, um, hmm? and, uh, Shin Godzilla, the 200... Uh, oh, there you go. 2016 um, movie. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. not a fan of it, but uh, well, that's for another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, I'm going to quit jawboning here. Tell me how you came to uh, discover Godzilla, either the 54 or the 56 version, or you know, just Godzilla in general, and why, why are you a fan? <laughs> well, my first introduction when I was a kid was Godzilla versus Megalon, because it was everywhere. Uh, and the reason it was everywhere is because someone screwed up on the uh distribution rights for i believe the vhs copy of it uh they let the vhs version of it lapse into public domain and so it was everywhere but it was on cable for like all the time so i ran across it there and my dad was a big godzilla fan so i got to see the 56 version because again even in the early 80s with the video home video craze that was still the only one really on the shelves uh was that one it wasn't until years later i discovered oh, there's an actual Japanese cut. And then um, I saw some of the other Showa era ones as well because they were always on either on cable or uh, independent channel 18 in Milwaukee because that's where I'm from originally. Uh, they, needed show, they needed programming, so they would show some of these in an afternoon on a Saturday or on a Sunday. You would end up running across them uh, because they were filling time when there wasn't sports to show. So, you know, I, I got them in pieces, not really in order. Uh, it wasn't until, yeah, years later till I left. But I loved it. I mean, it's big monsters. You know, uh, for the longest time, it was just the monsters that was featured in a, a lot of those uh, mid to late. And I'm sure uh, Bill can definitely correct me. Uh, this is just my my viewing experience. But uh, a lot of those show era ones really were just mostly the, the monsters. I mean, the people were there, but it was more about the fighting of the creatures later on especially and then you know um i think you're, you're thinking more of the 70s films or it might be thinking of the 70s yeah i'm thinking of the 70s the, the 60s right yeah it, near the end i should say not not middle but yeah near the end when you and then you get into the weird kazuki ones and all of those but uh, uh godzuki i mean but yeah i just you know i love big monsters and those were the ones that i caught first were a little bit more of the the campier ones and then i went back um and i just i was a fan because yeah it, it big monsters fighting each other was amazing and here you know they're fighting on miniature sets and you know they're miniatures but there wasn't stuff like that really coming out of u.s viewing <laughs> you, you know like that for that scale those big huge monsters like that you weren't really getting those types of you had king kong but you got those few and far between whereas japan was was cranking these out you know there was a whole library of these godzilla films and so i get introduced to him and then my buddy when, who i met in middle school who uh one of them that i'm still friends with today he's a huge godzilla fan and he actually hooked me up with the uh, toho version that's my version uh not a blu-ray but it's the dvd 
version that's got on two different discs. It's got the Japanese version on one disc and the U.S. one on the other. Uh, in uh, the the U.S. one is the four three aspect ratio, and the Japanese one is from the thirty five millimeter print. So uh, so he caught me that. But yeah, I that I just fell in love with big monster films with those type of colorful monster battle ones from as bill mentioned more than like the 70s and that because those were the ones that were showing when i was a kid um and then uh, a few years ago before godzilla king of the monsters the legendary movie came out i noticed how many there were out at the time and how many days in the month were until leading up to godzilla so i did a full month to where i watched all the godzilla films because it was 31 Godzilla films, I think it was out at the time. And uh, so I, wa including the Netflix animated ones. So I watched one a day and reviewed it one a day and uh, leading up to Godzilla King Kong. And when doing that, I did some research. It's amazing how many American and Japanese versions of these films there are. It's not just the original and King Kong versus Godzilla, which we're going to be talking about on, on my show end of the month. Um, there's other versions as well, including Godzilla 1985. There were two different versions. Godzilla 2000. There's two different versions because one has the bad dubbing, which my friends and I went to see in the movie theater when Godzilla 2000 came out and we laughed our asses off as you have one of the dubbed lines go great caesar's ghost and the other great line from that one for the dubbing this was the dubbing that subtitle it was like this missile will go through godzilla like crap through a goose so you know i mean but the i i was my mind was blown how many of these especially from the 50s and early 60s there were two different versions of these of these films released and some of them are quite different than the others that as far as tone goes uh you know and other ones uh, not quite so much more just slight changes but it was crazy so that's that's my long and short of it two things hmm. before i forget hmm. and we're also going to get some to some comments because we got a bunch rolling in um 1998 Matthew Broderick starred in Godzilla, one of the most overhyped uh, and poorly received films oh. in blockbuster history. Bill, your biting the fist uh, is the exact right reaction. I remember going to see that with my friend Brian in the theater. And within the first minute of this, I think it was two hours or over two hours mm -hmm. long. It's over I over. knew. Yeah, I knew that I wanted to leave, but I was trapped there. Um, I think and honestly, in this I talk about this more than the, in the hypothetical but i actually had i think i blocked it out but i have a real world example of why these new remakes these extended franchises these zombie franchises can actually do harm to the legacy films that they're trying to capitalize on because i think that was actually my first real experience with godzilla because i'd heard a lot about it and everyone was hyping up oh it's a new godzilla movie I'm like okay let's see what this is all about and i went to see it i'm like this is really dumb and really boring. And I don't care if there's, you know, four decades or whatever it was that preceded this. Great. So there's four decades of this, not interested. And I think that's one of the things that kind of, you know, kept me away from these things, except for, you know, I watched the legendary ones for what I can't remember why I watched those. Mm -hmm. Was it for? I don't know if it was for your show, Mark, but uh, or or something else. I think it was at the time you were just you were just you were reviewing more things at the time, <laughs> more wide release. You were you were reviewing more wide release things at the time. What's funny yeah. is that is that Broderick one is part uh, Toho does consider it in its library of monsters, but it's not referred to as Godzilla. He's referred to as Zilla, mm -hmm. and he showed up in one of the later Godzilla films, Godzilla SOS, I think. Um, uh, the, the final wars final wars thank you uh godzilla final wars and it is the best battle because it lasts all of 10 seconds and it's toho really sticking its finger up at this monster because they have it poorly cgi'd it comes after godzilla godzilla literally grabs him throws him into the australian opera house and proceeds to atomic fire him completely and the whole fight takes less than 30 seconds <laughs> To be, I, I uh, watch that. Most of the fights in that movie are about thirty. That's true. So. That's true, though. You're right. But it well, just—it's funny how they treated that. One. 
Well, I mean, rightfully so, because, mm -hmm. wow. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, and one of the reasons that I, I just couldn't jive with the uh, the Raven Burr version, is I was with it for a while because... <laughs> Yes, Steve Martin, intrepid reporter who gets kind of distracted on his international trip. He sets down in Japan to go meet with a scientist friend or something. And all of a sudden, there's this giant monster on the rampage, and he sticks around to cover it. Fine. It's his kind of travelogue. He's narrating the whole thing. It starts off with him emerging from the wreckage of, you know, Tokyo and flashing back, you know, a week ago, things were very different. Um and that's fine, except that he starts talking about um, these characters, you know, Ogata, uh, Emiko, uh, Shirozawa, these acquaintances he comes to know who are in like this love triangle. And one's a military guy, the other's a scientist, and there's the girl caught in between and referring to situations that he finds himself in, like he just happens to be wherever they are. But halfway through the movie, I think it's because they ran out of ways to insert Raymond Burr into it. They just start following this trio of characters and the movie shifts to intimate scenes between these three that Raymond Burr would have no knowledge of and has no connection to. And all of a sudden the narration drops out. So it's completely sloppy. I understand they were doing the best that they could with what they had, but then you go and watch the source material and you're like, Oh, that's why none of this made any sense. There is a beautiful scene that completely underscores Shirozawa's sacrifice at the end. And I'm not going to put up the spoiler banner, folks, because it's 70 years old. Most of you have probably seen Godzilla. Most of you are probably yelling at your screen right now, saying two things. A, Ian, read the comments already. And B, how is it that you've never seen Godzilla before now? Well, I haven't. But I rectified that situation the other day. But Shirozawa uh, is talking about how he's created this um, oxygen, just like little capsule with the moving parts it basically sucks or it converts all matter that it comes in co into contact with or all the oxygen into liquid or something it basically disintegrates uh, all underwater life in the vicinity and he doesn't want he discovered it by accident um, and he's terrified of what he's made it's a great metaphor for for the atomic age i think um he decides that he doesn't want to use it even to stop Godzilla until Godzilla destroys Tokyo. And he's convinced, well, there's <laughs> there's only one way to do it. Um, but he also doesn't want this weapon to get out to the wider world. And Ogata and Emiko say, well, you can just destroy it. And he's like, well, yeah, I can burn all my paperwork and destroy all my research, but bad people can get a hold of me and torture me for the information I have in my head. And at the end of the film, Ogata is on the ship and he goes down to take the oxygen destroyer and Shirozawa decides, I'm going to go with you. And at the end, much like another great movie from 1998, Armageddon, uh, he decides to stay behind to see the mission through and save the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that speech about not letting the uh, people who would torture him to get the information to reconstruct the bomb that really drives home like his sacrifice at the end like why is he doing this he's it's a really dark moment but it's also kind of tender and what do we get in the raymond burr version nothing that entire speech is gone you get him uh for out of like no context he goes ah and then all of a sudden he decides to go burn his paperwork and there's no mention of torture or any of that nonsense so more strikes against mr raymond burr's version okay we're going to start from the top here indulge me dear panelists and audience as we go through the comments. Mr. David Wilt joining us once again. Uh, one of the Transformers movies that probably no one ever talks about is the 80s animated. What do you mean no one ever talks about? This is the only one I ever talk about. The we song talk by... about that one quite a bit. <laughs> David Wilt, the song The Touch by Stan Bush is a very iconic 80s song. Yes, and I got to meet Stan Bush. M probably my top three celebrity encounters ever. ever. I met him at Comic-Con by chance. And I have a signed photo of him with his awesome guitar and his even more awesome 80s hair. And he asked me, hey, I got a new album out. Would you like to buy that for 10 bucks? I said, uh, no, thanks. But it was great meeting you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Renee Cruz, uh, lots of emojis. And Godzilla X Kong, the new empire. OK. Um, <laughs> Dave Wilt says again, I think that what makes the original Godzilla such an iconic movie is it came out during the time when America had feared the atomic bomb. I think there's there's a lot to that, but I think that's one of the disappointments that I had with 
Godzilla 56 is I feel like they still could have gotten a lot of that. And, and I'm, I'm looking at this through a 2024 lens, but I'm thinking there's so much great social commentary that's woven into the science fiction story of the original Godzilla that they could have easily poured that over with voiceover or other characters, you know, standing in for, you know, with Raymond Burr. I don't know. It just seemed like the popcorn version of a really serious sci-fi film. The, and again, I understand its importance, but, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. the, one of the, the big things that I noticed when I saw it, I finally saw the, the original version was uh, a scene on a train with commuters uh, and uh, one of the, they're talking about, it's almost like lighthearted, like, oh, I got to evacuate again. And, you know, I had to go through Nagasaki. I don't want to have to do with that. Uh, and then in that, um, not in that meeting where Dr. Yamani shows the slides and um, starts talking about um, the, the fact that Godzilla is radioactive, there's a, a pretty obvious indication that uh, they, they want to cover this up because they don't want a certain country to get upset with them and obviously that country is the united states and i found both of those things to be really really um strong and uh like meaningful and you know it's like well this isn't just a giant monster movie right and those stuck out to me too and that that scene that you just mentioned about uh the the cover-up that was what led to the big kind of argument that kerfuffle because there are the two kind of factions like i don't care if 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 certain people get mad at us we have to stop this thing you know, we, we need to get the, the word out one of the subtitles has uh there's a, a woman who's saying that we have to um let this stuff out and uh on one of the versions of the subtitles the things i've seen the other politician says Pipe down, you crackpot. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I don't think that's on all of them. No, um, that's that, that's not on all of them, no. The one that I saw <laughs> that most I got to get that one. You know, that, that would be the next Criterion version is to collect all the weird subtitled versions and put those as alternate yeah. subtitle options. Well, the, the Criterion crack one has different subtitles than um, that one that you have, Mark. Um, that this was one? the yeah. first, um, yeah. I think my friend Ed did the uh, commentary on that one. Really? Oh, so, cool. yeah. You, the, 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 he, the, yeah, the, Ed, Ed Gazacheski. Gazacheski. His real you. name, by the way. Oh, uh, I believe it. <laughs> he is the, you know, you probably should have gotten him on here because he could go in depth on this like way more than me. Uh, he and uh, his. Um, Friend Steve Rifle wrote a book called, um, well, I've got it right here, a biography of uh, Ishiro Honda. Oh, nice. nice. It tells a lot. Um, that's, that's actually really good. Got a foreword by Martin Scorsese. Um, a very small foreword. <laughs> uh, if you get a chance to listen to that um, commentary, I really recommend it. it they, okay. they get really into depth with it. and. Mm -hmm. You know, unlike a lot of commentaries where like, yeah, that was a really hot day where we were filming that. Yeah, well, it was hot, all right. All right, I'll get off the soapbox for a while. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. David Wilt again. I think that what makes uh, these giant monsters so iconic is during the first half of the movie, we don't see the monster in its full form. Mm -hmm. That's that's true. You know, I, Spielberg, I think, kind of aped this a few years later with uh, with Jaws. And um, mm -hmm. it's interesting because I actually watched the first maybe 15, 20 minutes of Godzilla 56 uh, with my son because on YouTube, there's a very strange series. I don't even know what they're called, but uh, they're these crudely animated mon kaiju monster matches where you've got Godzilla fighting all assortment of different creatures. Some, you know, other legit kaiju, some internet meme monsters like uh, Skibbity Toilet, which if you don't know what that is, don't look it up. Mm -hmm. Um but he became obsessed with Godzilla. He drew a picture of Godzilla that I've got hanging up in the hall. It's very cute. So I said, hey, you want to watch... The original Godzilla, he said, I don't like black and white movies. Um, and then after I picked him up off the floor, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, I said, no, it, it'll be fun. Uh, you know, you've never seen a black and white movie before. And it's it's cool. It's, you know, it's it's not lame like you might think it is. I mean, he's six. Um, but so we watched it and he was kind of into it. But then he said, Dad, can we turn this off? 
And I realized it's because we hadn't seen Godzilla and it was like 20 minutes in. And this is the Raymond Burr version. There's so much talking and exposition and meetings and stuff. But like the most we see, I think, is the initial attack on the village on Odo Island where it's at night and you just see Godzilla's leg like in the corner of the screen behind a house. And then you've got that great shot of it looked like someone left their toy helicopter on the beach and it just kind of like tips over. It's the yeah. one miniature effect that I thought was kind of dodgy in the whole thing. But, you know, what do I know? Um, so we fast forwarded to part of the attack on Tokyo and I was like, isn't this cool? And he's like, yeah. And like, you want to finish watching this later? No. Um, so, yeah, we got some learning to do. But watching the Honda version from 54 it feels like it moves a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. it, it takes probably half the time to get really get into the business of, of what is this monster. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. The original Godzilla came out the same year Raymond Burr starred in the iconic Hitchcock classic Rear Window. Was mm -hmm. that really 50, uh, 54? <laughs> wow. Man. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a creepy performance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One of the most popular series to use Japanese footage was the series Power Rangers. That yep. series was American version of the Japanese yep. called Super Sentai. Not to be confused with Super Hentai, which is uh, something <laughs> else entirely. Else entirely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I think Godzilla was inspired by the 1953 movie. Oh, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Godzilla. I think Godzilla uh, stepped by his, uh, his place there and knocked his uh, <laughs> background over. Oh man, we should we should do like the vibration. Oh, he's attacking the live stream. Uh, um, but I think I would have loved it, it if I could have had uh, arranged like like five naked women to go screaming. Um, there you go. But, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but Bill, you're not you're not that often here. <laughs> well, also you're not you're not recording from your basement tonight. Um, so I think. I think Godzilla was inspired by the 53 movie, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, and both movies include a scene where a monster attacks a lighthouse. Um, lighthouse and Godzilla? Well, okay, yes, definitely inspired by, um, in fact, Ray Harryhausen, who animated The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, hated Godzilla um, because he just felt it was a ripoff, and um, I think It'd be a little ironically, I think that uh, Godzilla actually was a better movie than Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms. I mean, um, you know, in in Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms, the monster was uh, killed by a radioactive uh, bullet or yeah capsule. So uh, that 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 sort of different approach of uh, radiation is your friend. To, uh, <laughs> you're all gonna die. Um, I think is it, it, it a pretty uh, big thing. But yeah, it, uh, I think even one of the original titles for the film had something like the giant monster from 20,000 leagues or, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it is definitely, I wouldn't call it a ripoff, but I would call it inspired by, and originally it wasn't even going to be, um, uh, it was, it came about because a, a deal that fell through with uh, a movie that was to be made in Indonesia and the producer, Tomoyuki Tanaka, was flying back and desperately trying to find something that he could use. And um, he said something about like being on the plane, looking down at the ocean, and then like wondering, well, what would it be like if something came up out of there? And um, so there, there we are. Um, anyway, wow. uh, I don't remember Godzilla attacking a lighthouse in the first film. I mean, I, I, I don't either. But I, there were, uh, I don't know if there was an attack, but wasn't there? There was a, a concern about like not having the, um, the beacons, the the spotlights, the big spotlights, uh, because that would that would attack or uh, draw his attention. But I don't know if that was a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. I did pick up, and I think this might have been a, a difference between the fifty four and the fifty six version. Uh, because in the 54 version, they definitely made a big deal about, you know, not using those uh, spotlights. Um, and then when he goes to attack the reporters, there's that clear shot of their like flash bulbs and, yeah. and cameras and stuff going off. And that really drew his attention. I didn't pick up on that in the Steve Martin cut. So I don't even know if that line was in there, but it's no, it great wasn't. because not only is there, it's a real moment of horror when you realize 
oh yeah, they just made that spotlight comment like five minutes ago, and now we're seeing the camera flashes go off, so those guys are screwed. But also, just the the resignation of those reporters. There's the one guy who's like yelling into the microphone, like, Godzilla's coming, he's, he's gonna, I think this might be the end, I'm signing off, folks. He's not, he's like gone insane. He's not yeah. scared, he's it, not panicking, no one's he's trying to escape. Wet, mm -hmm. and he's, he's, you can, <laughs> it looks like the guy really is terrified. And contrast that with Raymond Burr, who once again is like watching from some vantage point, like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Oh, um, all right. Let's see. On the series Rugrats, the character Reptar was inspired by Godzilla. All right. Yep. Um, in the 70s, there was a Godzilla animated series. Yep. I've actually got about six episodes on uh, DVD. Was that released. like an American series yeah. or like a yeah. Japanese series? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hanna Barbera. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Hanna Barbera, so you can know what the um, animation's like too. So yeah, it's it's <laughs> Fred it's, Flintstone show up and fight Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's 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 interesting. It's really yeah. Even it's, I didn't watch that. So yeah, it's it's a it's not an easy watch. Maybe when you're very young, sure, but watching it now, it's it's it hurts. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's see. Oh, yes. That, okay. David, yes. thank you for reminding me of the actual first Godzilla movie I ever watched. <laughs> when I was 11, I saw the animated short Godzilla vs. Bambi. He's reminding me of that now. Um, they, they played I, I that, assume you've all they, seen this. They played that before the 19, uh, Godzilla 1985 mm -hmm. because uh, I remember the big media blitz because there was even a news report because they had a guy in a suit show up at like the New York premiere or something and they were showing footage of it and so i went to see it in the theater and beforehand there was this line drawing animation and i'm like what's this and it said godzilla godzilla versus bambi and i'm like okay and they show it, it, it you know it's so short but they actually put that in front of godzilla 1985 yeah. and i saw that in the theater we just laughed it was hilarious that used to be a, a staple of like well they used to have these animation festivals where they would show animated shorts for you know two hours or something every year. And yeah, that one would show up all the time. Directed by a guy named Marv Newland, who uh, uh, later um, became kind of a celebrity in the short animation character crowd. Hmm. Well, I just remember that the gimmick of that was you had this deer like eating grass and the credits going by Godzilla versus Bambi, like written by Mark, Marv Newland. Marv Newland. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then like all the credits were him, like edited yeah. and all this stuff. And at the very end, boom, Godzilla's foot just comes down and mashes Bambi. I first saw that, I think I was 11. Uh, I got a VHS tape of like, I think it was called like weird cartoons or crazy mm -hmm. cartoons. And they had all a bunch of these shorts. And one of them wasn't even a cartoon. It was a, it, it was, I don't know when it was from the forties maybe, but um, it was a live action mixed with um, kind of like stop motion animation. I, I think it's a pretty famous short of a guy working in a factory and this little bird hatches out a car and this car hatches from an egg and like kind of like unfolds. And it's, it, it, I still don't know how the hell they did it because it was very smooth, but I'll have to find that someday. Um, anyway, yeah, Godzilla versus Bambi. I love this. I'm, I'm dredging up all these movies. Godzilla has been with me my entire life. I just didn't know he was there. <laughs> um all right, so one, sorry, of the th one of the things that you notice watching them back to back, and it, it's what I noticed when I did my my monthly Godzilla film, but especially watching the 56 and 54, if you watch them just back to back like that, is there the 56 version tries a little bit to play the angle of the evil of radiation and, and nukes, kind of. It, it's There is tossed in there about, you know, how Godzilla got woke up, but you're just missing a lot more of the human element that the 54 has because the 54 has literally a scene where, if I remember correctly, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but there's one scene where Godzilla's walking up and I think it's a mom or a parent or something, and a kid, and they're by a building and they see Godzilla walking up and there's no music. It just, you see Godzilla walking up to it and they just look terrified and you get other moments like that to where, you know, in the beginning, 
they they breeze breeze by the whole setup that the 54 version does in the 56 version they breeze by it of the shipping lanes getting ruined and how mm -hmm. there's no fish in the sea for these folks to catch so they could actually live because these villages are rely on the fish you know i mean there's there's so much of that human element missing in the 56 version because they got Raymond Burr to pull an Orson Welles of Transformers to where they gave him a script and said, okay, stand here. You're going to see a creature of some sort. And he's like, uh, okay. And now read this line. Uh, but I don't even know if he saw footage of Godzilla beforehand and for, you know, for being a global reporter, did he have to remind us so many times that his Japanese was rusty or it was rough <laughs> or he couldn't quite understand Japanese. What are they saying? And they got the most, uh, most Americanized Japanese actors to act around him because we're talking 56 here. So you're just like, it's like totally different tone between these two films. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, um, the mother and her, I think it was one or two kids, but yeah, two. Yeah. They two. Okay. Her, um, in the hospital uh and the mom is dead and yep. the, the kids start crying um i don't know how the kids survive because it seemed like a building was dropped on them the mom has dialogue uh, about how you know it's okay it's okay you're, you're gonna see your father soon yes which is you you know that's yeah. right it's it's really dark and surprising and i think it's right around that time you see some people who are like kind of on this balcony and then it, godzilla swipes it or steps on it something and the whole thing comes crashing down i mean you don't need a lot of inserts of people like actually dying or, or gore or anything like i think seeing it from that remove just really sells the, the the casualness of godzilla walking through these villages and i think that's or these cities and it intellectually I put something together in my head. I'm like, yeah, these are all models or, or a lot of it, is, you know, are models. And that's kind of fine because I think that goes along with the idea of, you know, to, to us who are, you know, Godzilla's 400 feet tall, we would be just like batting around playthings and stomping through cardboard. You know, he wouldn't even really notice until he gets electrocuted. And my goodness, the special effects uh, in Godzilla, I'll just refer to the Godzilla 54 because the 56 version, it had a lot of that stuff in there. But like you were saying, Mark, a lot of the detail, a lot of the kind of the setup to the big action set pieces really is missing. It's noticeable. But like when he charges up like the giant spikes on the back of his uh, body, I've seen that I've seen the legendary versions. I've seen the trailers for the new Godzilla movies. And I'm sorry, I keep harping on them. No, I'm not sorry. No, you're not. But don't lie. <laughs> you see them charge up, and now they're pink, I guess, and before they were blue and everything. But it's not impressive because I know how that stuff is done now. In Godzilla 54, I'm looking at this 70-year-old cinema technology, and I don't know how they do it. I mean, so, I'm sure there's probably some simple explanation, and I don't want either of you to break the magic for me here on this <laughs> live stream, but it's just so impressive watching this special effect like i believe what i'm seeing whereas the problem with the modern films and like a lot of cgi blockbusters now is i do believe what i'm seeing but i just don't care because there's no mystery as to how it was done i've always liked the uh, the the uh, fins dorsal fins lighting up like generally before you should, it's like this weird thing that's like well, where did they come up with that because you know you, you wouldn't you know, you'd have a dragon or something, but you would never have like other parts of its body light up before it shoots flame. And I like that anticipation. And that, I mean, that's always been one of the more unique things about this, um, about this monster in general, is that you have this sort of ramping up thing and it's not done like super dramatic or anything. It's just like, oh, this is happening now. And then, <laughs> you know, that's, that's when you first see that he has some kind of the, the atomic uh, ray is that uh, as when he melts the high tension towers, which by the way were made out of wax, and that explains how that by um big, huge studio lights, which I thought was it's a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. They really, um, you know, the, the, the effects director A.G. Suvaraya said that uh, something in the nature of like our effects are born out of our poverty, mm -hmm. and we've had to 
it was like just come up with like whatever we can do to make something work because they just didn't have the resources. Even though at that time Godzilla was uh, tied with uh, Seven Samurai for being the most expensive film um, mm. that Toho would produce until that time. Well, I mean, but, you talk about the the melting power lines. I mean, that's another. You you tell me it's uh, it's wax being melted by studio lights. That's a great how. But when I'm watching that scene and I see, you know, the they look like white hot. Yeah. metal that's that's bending and melting under the power of this this atomic ray but i also want to comment on i knew that godzilla breathed fire but i don't and i'm not sure if this is in the other movies or if they actually use a fire breathing kind of effect like they do in the the legendary movies now it's all like a cgi beam that comes out of his mouth but what fascinated me was you'd get a close-up of godzilla's head and neck and you kind of go ah. and there was like a mist almost blowing out of his out of his mouth or like a spray it wasn't fire but then you'd cut to whatever he had blown that onto and then it kind of catches on fire it's it's very it's very interesting it's almost spookier than actually seeing the flames come out of his mouth it's like almost whatever he breathed out exploded on contact with uh, with the surface of whatever it hit it was. I'm not sure how they did that effect. I think it might have been as simple as having a spray can inside of the puppet mm -hmm. head. Um, it it kind of looks like that, but I, I think it's a combination of the music and the, and the roar and that 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 yeah that it does sound like a spray can, but it's just so it's yeah it's spooky yeah. And, and unexpected. Um, let's see. Oh, hold on. David's back in the scene where the scientist first shows his girlfriend his oxygen destroyer. We don't see it. We can tell by the expression on her face that she sees something horrible. Yeah, that's a. That was a, a great moment because I actually rewound. I cheated. I rewound because I'm like, wait, did we see what she saw? No, we see that mm -hmm. later. It was a great uh, moment of a flashback. And I just want to talk about that that story, that that love triangle between uh, you know Ogata and Emiko and Shirozawa. You know, she was engaged to be married to Shirozawa, but she was in love with uh, Ogata really mm -hmm. and there was that whole like angle of he's working for the Ogata's working for the government and Emiko actually Ogata, Ogata works for a shipping company yeah oh, I was a shipping okay that's yeah. why he was on the boats and stuff mm -hmm. I it, I was kind of I thought he was he was he was hanging out with the military a lot probably because of the shipping uh the, the boat connection but the point is Emiko gets this uh this secret that Shirozawa shares with her about the the oxygen destroyer and he's like, you can never tell anybody about this. And of course, she tells her uh, <laughs> boyfriend and her father, the great uh, uh, Dr. Yamane, um, you know, he is the one who's championing, let's study Godzilla. Let's try and not necessarily capture it because I don't think we can, but we shouldn't just kill it because it's the greatest scientific discovery ever. And it isn't until, you know, later in the movie where everyone kind of realizes, well, we might not have a choice. Mm -hmm. Because this thing unleashed could could wipe out you know everybody if it escapes you know Japan, um, but yeah these these great kind of moral dilemma dilemmas and quandaries uh, are all over the film and when we see this oxygen destroyer we see the look on Emiko's face and she screams and she you know practically passes out and then later we get to see what actually happens to that tank in a flashback. And it's horrifying. We see these beautiful fish swimming around, and then all of a sudden, through the magic of you know editing and smoke in an aquarium, I guess we see them turn into bones. And that's something that I really want to get into uh, your theories about this. In the 1956 version, there's no talk about because uh, they cut out Dr. Yumani's speech about you know well there's other radiation out there. There could be more Godzillas. In that version, it's pretty definitive. Godzilla, we see him turn into bones, and then those bones turn into nothing, to pure water. So at the end of the 56 version, there's like, well, how the hell are they going to make a Godzilla sequel? Where's the end of the first Godzilla? It's implied that, yes, this Godzilla turned to dust, but much like Jaws the Revenge from 1987, there could be relatives out there somewhere. Well, it's, that... it's a little funny mm -hmm. because um, in 1955, they made the sequel. Yeah, because you know, pre the Raymond Burr version. The Raymond Burr, so by the way, got released in Japan, and they 
cropped it into CinemaScope. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a little weird. I got a poster for it, and I, I don't think I actually haven't watched it, but um, it's a yeah, I don't, it's just one of those weird things that uh, you don't have an easy explanation for. I was going to say one of the things that I really like about uh, Dr. Yamani's character, played by um, Takeshi Shimura, who's a great, great actor. Um, if he, He's the leader of the Seven Samurai. Um, there's a film called Ikiru, which is called uh, To Live, and he plays a guy dying of stomach cancer that just, you know, if you don't start crying at the end of that movie, then, you know, they're... anyway, he his he's not like just one of these scientists that would say like, oh, we got to keep him alive he's, and just to study him. He's like, well, we need to study him because he survived the bomb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to see, and, and if he can survive the bomb, maybe there's a way that human beings could. And I thought that was a really nice touch that, you know, it isn't just a, some kind of pure, you know, scientist who's going to, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen the Howard Hawks version of the thing, but um, yep. the scientist there who basically, you know, flips out and, um, you know, the thing is, he's killing everybody, but, you know, he stands in the way and, you know, whatever. But uh, Yamani actually has more depth than, uh, than that. Uh, but, yeah, then once Tokyo is destroyed, it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah well well and that's the thing is like there wasn't i don't think that was a thank you for reminding me because that was a, a layer of his character that i'd forgotten about um but there wasn't the modern conception of the nefarious scientist that mm -hmm. we get where it's like oh we should keep him alive like like something from weyland yutani uh like we got to keep it alive so we can <laughs> study it and use it as a weapon you know perhaps to get back at the united states or 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 those other countries that were kind of mentioned um was that ever a conception in any of the other like sequels like figuring out the secrets of Godzilla to weaponize it, or was it all about just like staving no. off these monsters? Mm -mm. No, hmm. no, they, I, I mean, you get aliens later on involved, uh, <laughs> that, that kind of use the monsters of earth you get, but humans themselves, I think the only weaponization you could say is when you get to the Mecha Godzilla, but the reason, but that's not involving Godzilla itself. It's creating a weapon to fight, or defend themselves against Godzilla based off of Godzilla. Um, and, and you, you get, so you get Mecha Godzilla, but I don't, yeah, I don't, I can't think of any where it's humans weaponizing him. <laughs> no, well, nothing. Yeah. In all the 70 years of Godzilla movies, they've never come up with that idea of like, let's turn Godzilla into a weapon to like fight our enemies. The aliens think, do that to try to take over the earth a few times, right. but um, no, there's um, not people. No, no countries ever try to take take him those, over. Those monsters are treated more like as just uh, I don't know forces of nature, hurricanes, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I know, but but even even the United States has like experimented with energy weapons. Now, look, I'm 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 just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying. Like make a sequel, like they did with Godzilla minus one. Make a sequel to one of these aliens attack and try and use Godzilla against us movies. And say, Whew, I'm glad we survived that. But those aliens had the right idea. What if we could harness the power? I'm surprised, guys. Okay, we got. I'm going to turn off this live stream. We're going to go write this script together <laughs> and make well, tens of dollars. In in, in destroy all monsters, uh, the the ten monsters that are taken over by the aliens. The the Earth people do crack the code, as yeah. it were and are able to control to attack the aliens. Of course, at that point, the aliens send King Ghidorah in to have a, the big battle of lots of giant monsters. Yes. I love I love Destroy All Monsters. That one's so... It, it's a lot of fun. It yep. is a lot of fun. I, you know, I'm going to have to check it out. I'm going to... I'm As I mentioned... Like, I finally get the Godzilla thing now. You guys, I've always appreciated your love for, for these movies. I just never really got it, I think, because I spent my time watching all the wrong ones. Um, but, you know, Godzilla 54, the, the Raymond Burr one is a fascination. I would even recommend that if, if you've never seen Godzilla somehow, mm -hmm. that you watch both those movies back to back. I think it's a, a, a great kind of like, 
not even just for what the they did with this movie, but just think of the possibilities of other ways you could do that with with different films, just like intercut someone, you know, a, being an observer somewhere. I mean, you could do that with 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 anything. You could do that with Alien. Um, I don't know. I'm just I'm rambling at this point. Well, I, but I, um, I, yeah, hmm? with, the, with the Raymond Burr thing, um, I know that it's inferior. I don't think they did it that terrible of a job with it. I mean, at least looking. You know, like from my point of view, um, it is a little bit, I hesitate to use the word racist, but it is a little like, well, we can't accept a movie with a bunch of Japanese people running around in it. Um, well, I mean, especially it, because you're talking, you're talking about, you know, this was it just is. a decade removed from like Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor. So yeah. And, and internment camps and mm -hmm. like, it wasn't exactly like, Hey, there's a great Japanese sentiment running running through the red, white, and blue. So yeah, but, I, I can understand. Well, I, I thought about that at the time. Yeah, too. Um, think about you know you, you've already done like uh, some of these movies, uh, the Quater Mess movies with Brian um, Dunlavy, mm -hmm. where it was like, well, a supremely British character replaced by an American, a uh, Curse of the Demon. You have uh, Dana Andrews um, as the, the star, as American, everybody else is British. And so, I mean, and those are all 50s movies. And I don't know, I mean, maybe it is just this kind of thought at that time. It's like, well, we can't just have a bunch of foreigners running around, even <laughs> if they speak English. They're, they're products of their time, for sure. I yeah. mean, you know, we did, we did a series called It Came From The 50s, where we were looking at, you know, uh, 50s monster films uh one each month and and it was very interesting to see the wide spectrum of how they approached the the creatures or the aliens or where they come from as well as their approach to you know uh, uh foreign uh <laughs> immigrants and such as well and you're you're right it, they couldn't probably in 50 there's sitting here going this is a cool monster film but there's no way we're going to be able to market it to our western audience if we don't have and then they, you know, they cast one of the most probably American of American guys to to play, you know, and then they got some Asian actors, but then the Asian actors speak, you know, perfect English, <laughs> you, you know, for the most part. And so, yeah, it, it was to, to get people you know, to the box office. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah, they had slight accents, some of them, but uh, some of them, you know, spoke very clear. And it, it's just a product of its its time because they... Hollywood is all about money and they're like, that's the only way they figured they're going to market it to this audience. Some of them, many of them were veterans. <laughs> you, you know, you're, you're not going to want a, a Japanese led film if you're going to want it to be successful at the box office. And that came out right. during the time that these um, monster movies were at a, right. a, a bit of a peak. Um, it's to me, it's kind of amazing that, um, the American movies, the, the all the, the 50s B movies coming, starting from like them and going through, you know, Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, everything else, that kind of stuff petered out in the United States in the, I think in the early 60s. Yeah. But in Japan, they just kept making these things, Thanks. not just Godzilla movies, but uh, they, they had their own King Kong movies. They had uh, different alien invasion movies. Uh, Mysterians was great. I love Mysterians. Yeah, we can. I can spend a whole year talking about that film <laughs> with theme, but you don't want to hear that. <laughs> well, not yet. But no, I mean, the, I I do want to say about the the Raymond Burr version and some of the you know, it's not a controversy, but I mean, just like the idea of you know the Americanization of this this Japanese film. You know, one thing I will say is that. It is, I think, very respectful in its handling of these characters, right? Even though a lot of them are inserted mm -hmm. because you've got to get this, this, you know, American actor into this situation. So like, okay, he was on his way somewhere else and he stopped over in Japan. And he's got this friend and he's, you know, he's talking to all these different people, these different situations. He's treating them all as, as peers and, and friends. And he is very much is in a lot of ways, a fish out of water. And so he's not busting in there with his big American bravado. And, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to straighten this whole thing out and save the world. Um, you know, he's in many, he's, he's a competent professional 
um, but he's not a cartoon, you know, mm -hmm. GI Joe American hero guy. So that was that was nice to see. It's just that while I was watching him in this movie, I could very clearly see the cuts of like, okay, so this is the part like him and his friend were like sleeping outside in this tent on Odo Island. And I could tell that the the stuff that was going on inside the house, that was from the real movie. And this whole thing with the tent, my wife had like popped in to watch a couple minutes of it. It's like, what, why are they like, it's outside there. There's like a typhoon going on. They're still like lying there. Why don't they go for cover or something? What are they doing? And that was my whole question. The first, the opening of this film where Raymond Burr is, or sorry, Steve Martin is in the rubble. I felt like that went on for five minutes. I mean, he's just like, it's just voiceover of him. Like, what, what's going on? Oh, uh, I, still what's what it took forever. And I think that's one of the reasons that my son checked out. Whereas mm -hmm. yeah, Honda knew how to get down to business. That's yeah. that's all I'm saying. And, and, and don't forget about the, the stand-in bodies for the American <laughs> version, the stand-in folks who were shot all from behind. Yep. Oh, yeah, when, when he met Emiko and she's like... <laughs> Very sure. yeah. oh. I, one thing that is, that is interesting though, is that, you know, he's he was stuck in there to to get, like, uh, a, an American name on the, on the poster, whatever. Yeah. But later on in the 60s... Um, they started having American actors in there. Um, Nick Adams was in uh, two films. Um, Russ Tamblin was in War of the Gargantuas. Um, Cesar Romero and Joseph Cotton were in Latitude Zero in like 1970. A very strange film. Um, and uh, Rhodes Reason was in King Kong Escapes. So. They, they eventually, like, went, as these films became more popular, not just in Japan, but also overseas, um, the people in Toho started making deals and, um, you know, getting some Americans. And those, those would generally be the lead um, characters in these movies. Well, I mean, that's kind of what you're seeing now with the legendary films. I mean, with the King Kong and the Godzilla and the whole like monsterverse thing, you've got like Sam Jackson, John C. Riley, Dan Stevens, um, you know, a lot of, you know, bigger names in these, you know, kind of, I guess, om modern day homages to the, the classic movies. I, I, I feel like I'm going to throw up even just saying that. But um, yeah, so, uh, okay. I want to end on a positive note. I loved Godzilla. I love talking to you guys about it. I know we we're kind of pinballing all over the place, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it was a fascinating kind of experiment to watch these movies, you know, almost back to back. I think only separated by one or two evenings. Um, but yeah, if you've never seen Godzilla, I highly recommend it. You know, definitely pick up the Criterion Blu-ray or go see it like at a revival house. I mean, it's the 70th anniversary, so it's chances are it's going to be playing somewhere at a theater, like an art house theater near you if you have one like at the music box in Chicago in, in June uh, information down below. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely go check that out. I do want to see this on the big screen. So I'm going to have to swing by the music box because even watching it on television, I know I said I was going to wrap it up, but I do have to go on one more jag. I hadn't seen any other Ishiro Honda movies, Bill or Mark. I assume you have. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I just don't know. Is this indicative of his style of, filmmaking um yes and no after i mean the next film that he directed uh the next godzilla film that he directed was uh king kong versus godzilla which is a comedy i mean it's an, an intentional comedy uh making fun of commercialization um and the other films then are they're, they're 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 sort of more straightforward. They're not like very they're not really as heavy or dark. Um, they're they're fun films, mm -hmm. um, well done. I think they've got like uh, a lot of good uh, you know, from the this a sort of Toho actors uh, <laughs> collection. Um, he uses a lot of them. Like the the actor who played Ogata, Akira Takarada, is in a lot of the other films. Yeah. Um, and so is um, Dr. Yamane and uh, Dr. Sarazawa. Um, you, you just see these guys. Sometimes they only have like, like, like a little walk-on role. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> and if you've seen these films enough times, you start recognizing all these little weird yep. 
players and things that are sort of the, the Toho regulars. Um, yeah, yeah, the guy who played uh, 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 Sirizawa, was it? The the Oxygen... Uh, yeah, Akihiko Hirata. Yeah, he was in a lot of them. When I was doing that 31 Days of Godzilla, I was like, oh, wait, he's in this again, only this time he's playing a different character. Yeah. And then, he's oh, got yeah, an no, eye on the other eye. No. Actually, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, and well. um, Ebira, um, yeah. he's, he's the... the Command, commandant of the uh, the red bamboo. Um, yeah. Uh, Abbey Rod, that's I've not seen it, but that is my favorite Beatles album. Um, <laughs> I just gotta say, come on, Bill, you gotta do the effect. What effect? The the sound, you know. Oh, I'm not gonna. Do that. I can't. I, I can't. Oh. I can't, can't do it on command. Create the sound of a uh, a, a rosin glove on a contrabass. <laughs> I didn't know that that was what that was. Anyway, uh, it'll be a mystery, uh, much like the International Judas. Um, but no, my, my question about Ishiro Honda was watching this movie on my quote-unquote big screen TV. Yes, it's only 43 inches. Mm -hmm. That's what she said. Um, I was like, I feel like I'm watching this on a big screen. I don't know what, what it was, but I definitely, there's just a, such a, a cinematic art to the 54 not so much the 56 Godzilla that, uh, yeah, I was completely swept up in it and, and lost in he this world. A, I can only imagine seeing it on a giant screen. He has a very um, uh, sort of documentary style. I mean, he'd made a number of other movies um, that were World War II um, based. And then he made like salary man, um, you know, slice of life movies. Uh, he, there's one theme that sort of runs through a lot of his science fiction movies is this sort of, um, how human beings have to kind of forget about borders and work together. Um, in the Mysterians, which is uh, called uh, in Japan, is called Earth Defense Force. The theme is, yeah, we got to stop like bickering, and we've got this other enemy to deal with. Uh, in in Gorath, there's a a giant, uh, or not a giant, but a a, a very dense planet that is uh, running towards earth and everybody has to get together and uh and <laughs> build giant jets in antarctica to move the earth out of the way <laughs> which wow is the subject of a movie called the wandering earth um, yeah but the wandering earth does not have a giant walrus in it so it is inferior <laughs> <laughs> did you guys ever see that episode of the new twilight zone called a small talent for war I don't think so. You can probably find it on YouTube. It's it's one of those like the shorter segments. Um, John Glover it, plays an alien who shows up at the UN and says, "You've got uh, we we've, our planet is part of a giant federation of intergalactic. You know, we're a consortium. And we've noticed that your planet has a small talent for war, and you guys better get your act together, or we're going to come back and blow you up." <laughs> and so two days later. He shows back up at the UN and the entire planet has come together. They they've signed all these peace treaties. They've completely disarmed. They've destroyed all their weapons. And the, the one representative hands John Glover's character, a, a huge book and says, here, it's all signed, sealed and delivered. See for yourself. The guy starts flipping through it. And he starts laughing. Mm -hmm. He's like, uh, there was a huge misunderstanding. Uh, we are a war. <laughs> we are a garrulish species. And your planet is just too pathetic in terms of its. Yeah, uh, you're you're not you're not warlike enough. So we have no no use for you. So now we're gonna blow you up, and then the ships close in on the planet. Everything goes dark. Very funny. It's and a twisted. cookbook. Mm -hmm. It it is a cookbook. That that's there should have been a recipe that fell out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But he wasn't a cannabis. He kind of looked like one though. Mm -hmm. Big shoulders. Anyway, I'm gonna let everybody go now. Uh, thank you, Bill and Mark. Um, all your information is going to be down below, maybe now, or if not now, then by tomorrow, along with the information for the Godzilla versus the music box and whatever else I can think to throw in. It's been a lot of fun catching up on Godzilla with you guys. Um, and folks out there, thank you for hanging out. Uh, David Wilt and uh, who else? I, I forgot. I got to go up and get this 
another comment. Uh, Rene Cruz, the big fan of Godzilla X Kong, the new empire. Thank you for, for commenting. And if you're watching this on the replay, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, let us know what is your favorite Godzilla movie, your favorite kaiju movie. Uh, what did you think of Godzilla 54? What did you think of Godzilla versus Steve Martin? Which is why I think Godzilla 56 should still be, should officially be called. Um, yeah. And if you like this live stream, please like, subscribe, all that business. And um, Bill, you're waving your hand. You want to either get off here or you want to say something. I'm surprised that you did not ask uh, Mark and I what our favorite uh, Godzilla films were. You're surprised I didn't ask you the most obvious question, Bill. You have not yeah. watched this show enough. Mm -hmm. Bill, well, what's your favorite Godzilla movie? <laughs> uh, my favorite is the 1964 uh, Mothra versus Godzilla. Oof, that's a, yeah. Um, I think it. it, uh, it I think the best one is the original one, but my favorite one uh, is, uh, is is Mothra versus Godzilla. I think it, it's got a great pace. It's got great payoff. It's got twin, thirty centimeter tall uh, girls that sing. Um, giant moth, giant caterpillars. Um, the the but the best Godzilla design in my yes. opinion. And um, I'm one of the best scores. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just, uh, it just works for me. Nice. Well, that's having an anniversary too. I'll have to watch that. <laughs> oh yeah, um, Monster, yeah. Monster versus Godzilla. Oh yeah, that is this this year, isn't it? Sixty it's years. Sixty. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, it's a hard call. I, 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 I'm not sure if I have a real favorite outside of the original. I, I'd say Destroy All Monsters I really enjoyed, mostly because of that was one of the first times I had seen something like that with so many big monsters fighting at once and being a lover at that point when I saw it, when I finally saw that film. Because uh, I, had, I had seen it because in our library in elementary school, we had a book, a Godzilla book, and there was a still from a promo still from destroy all monsters that had like eight monsters in it including godzilla and that and i'm like what movie is this i must find this and it took me forever and once i once i saw it i i that was one of those to where you know people are used to like crossovers and all kinds of things now wasn't a big thing with you know back then you know where, where you had so many Back and forth, yeah, you had a return of a monster occasionally in these films, but not that many at once fighting. And yeah, I I really dug that one, and that was one of the first ones where I was just like, mind was blown. So many of these monsters they put in because I was young when I watched it, so I didn't know anything about licensing. And oh yeah, these are all Toho films. Where I'm just like, holy crap! There's all these these monsters <laughs> fighting Godzilla. This is awesome. <laughs> Well, now I got to watch both these movies. So yeah. thanks for the recommendations. I, but, but he's right. Yeah. He's right about Mothra versus Godzilla. That's a just a gorgeous film, uh, really for a monster film. It's you. You should check out the the uh, 4K restorations that Toho has done on those films. They just they make the like the Criterion discs look. Uh, Mm. <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to now. Now with your with your recommendation, I wasn't sure on it, but yeah, I gotta can check you, this out. So. Where can you get those, Bill? Uh, Japan. Yeah. Well, you, oh. I ordered them through Amazon Japan, mm -hmm. yeah. and they sent okay. them to my house. <laughs> and they're they're just they're just region free, I guess. Or... Uh, Blu-ray has the same region as um, mm -hmm. the United States uh, uh, for Japan and the United States, and I think some other Asian countries. So. Um, all yeah. right. Well, they they play just. I don't have a 4K machine, so I just ordered the uh, the Blu-rays, and mm -hmm. you know, they're just blown away. Um, by I've got like four of them. Nice. Which I may wait for until, until they release Mysterians, and then <laughs> I'm going to be oh, you know, like I'm going to get an airplane and go over there <laughs> with and go to pick it up. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I, you won't have to make a special trip. I'm sure you've been you've been known to visit Japan, Bill. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I seriously, I'm going to let you guys go now. Thanks for for hanging out and talking about giant monsters. And um, yeah, we'll be back at some point. I don't know what we're doing next week, if anything. But um, whenever that is, whatever that is, thanks very much for watching, kicking the seat. This has been Gojira X Godzilla King of the Monsters. Thank you very much. Take care. And um, I don't have a giant monster war, so I'm just going to say... <laughs>
I'm sorry. Sorry. No. I just, I just gave Bill a 